uh, on the subjects of budgeting and scheduling for projects. For, uh, as I wrote in here, for teams that, that want to try and mature their approach to games user research, that requires a lot of pre-planning, which is very difficult. Often the barriers for just how do we make a produce a plan to get this started? We know the methods, but how do we provide the budgeting and scheduling around it? Uh, and we need to talk about how to do that well. So we've got three fantastic uh, speakers today to talk on that, uh, the first of which is Jean-Luc. Well, do you want to get started? Yes. Thanks, Jean-Luc. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Jean-Luc, and uh, we're going to look at a bunch of scheduling decisions that I made and that were the wrong call. Um, I displayed a behavior that was either idiotic or my thinking was slow, I ignored important work context, was kind of a dummy or a dumbo, if you will. Um, there you go. First, uh, a piece of context. I'm doing this talk while thinking ma mainly about the smaller user research teams. Um, I've watched a lot of really good talks from this conference coming from people working at like EA, Activision, Ubisoft, you name it. And often they present work that is meaningful, impactful, and relevant. And I can carry none of that over to my work context just because of the scale. They benefit from economies of scale that I just can't, at least not yet. Um, yeah, so, so that's the context. A few things that, to know about me. Um, I'm a user research manager. This is a bit lagging, but that's fine. I um, used to be a dev. My first two gigs in the industry were on the dev side of things. And uh, before my current gig, I was at Ubisoft. And before that, I was at Crytek. So my current gig is at Paradox. We're in Sweden. We are a publisher and a game developer. We make strategy games management games, and uh, role-playing games. Um, stupid thing number one. One day, I joined Paradox, coming fresh from Ubisoft, got assigned to do user research on a project. The devs making that game had never done user research before. So I show up and I go, oh, you've never done a playtest. We should do a playtest. And where I was coming from was that I had seen that tool being used e efficiently uh, at my previous gig. And I was like, of course this will help. And when I say playtest, think lab study with a large number of participants to look at usability and some kind of opinion data. And sometimes this really good tool is the wrong call. Sometimes there, there's a work context where pushing you and everybody that depends on you towards this kind of way of working can, be, can lead to like not so good outcomes. So I said that, right? On the other side, the devs receive this and go, OK, we, we, you're asking us to go from a user research budget of zero to a kind of a large activity, in all things cons considered with our budget. This sounds scary to me. To minimize risk, let's tie this to a milestone, meaning one of those big events in your game's production where you know, the devs know that it's a big deal anyway, even without user research. So we might as well use that game build, right? Because it's going to be uh, QA'd more, it's more resilient. Um, if that happens, th there's another thing that happens later down the line, which is when you bring the topic of study questions, study goals, everybody will not slightly nudge you towards, no, but is the game good, though? <laughs> so you're the researcher <laughs> trying to make a targeted kind of activity that will make sense to you and will be actionable, and everybody around you from two ranks below or, you know, to the left, or to two ranks above you, we'll go like, Let, let's, let's see if the game is good, though. <laughs> and on top of that, your very existence is already a disruption. There was no user research before, and now there is. So everybody that works with you is kind of like, oh, OK, cool. I don't really know what I'm buying from you, though. So all of those things add up. You end up with research that you're not proud of. And on top of that, if you're unlucky like I was, I ended up on a pattern. That thing I didn't like, I kept doing it uh, because we only interacted around milestones, barely interacted, very little you know, contact surfaces between me and the devs outside of the milestones uh, weeks. And it was always the same. Is the game good? Is the game better than last time? And that um, is something dumb that I regret doing. You shouldn't do that. Instead, do what my team does because there's better researchers than I am. 
And instead now, they open with something that we call a streaming session, which is a very tiny thing that you try to tie to um, a dev sprint. Uh, most of our dev teams work in you know, two weeks sprints, the usual. And the build at the end of that sprint isn't like perfect, but you can do some things around it. So what we do is that we you know, find one or two external participants, bring them in the lab, uh, put them in front of that build, and then they kind of do whatever. Because when we organize this, the player data, I don't care. I, irrelevant to me. What we're looking at as a user search team is what's going on in another room, which is the room where the devs are. And those are our data collection points. How many devs showed up? Which profession showed up? Why didn't the game designers show up? Oh, right, because you scheduled this on the day where they're never available. Um, and we also let them talk, right? And they just, the different professions talk to each other, they ask questions to the uh, user researcher, and that's what we get out of it. That's the entire point. Because we have more frequent interactions, and the devs, they get to do a little spend that gives them to kind of like interact with the new team in a low stakes context. Not that you know, intimidating to ask dumb questions if it's just like this small, tiny, cheap thing. And yeah, this, this works way, way better. And it has always led to the team, the dev team, s s accepting and onboarding into way bigger uh, activities. So in the end, I do get my large playtest that I want. But after this kind of like onboarding situation. Thing number one. Another time I was done, same starting situation. I end up being a researcher on a project, and I go, okay, how much money do you have? Cool. Let's do a bunch of like the normal playtest until we run out of money. By normal playtest, again, lab studies, relatively large sample sizes, and always looking at either, either usability or you know, all of the attitudinal stuff, like usually progression or a sense of challenge, how it's perceived over time. And where I was coming from is that if I make the game as best as I can, then I did it, right? I won. And it's really cool. I'm on this iterative loop where I get the game changed based on what I wrote in my reports. Feels good. So I do that. But did I do good? In that case, I didn't, because you can still behave that way and end up with an outcome where you put it on the market, and the market goes like, ah, <laughs> how's the game? Ah, it exists. <laughs> <laughs> and where I, I went really, really, really poorly is that this is something that I wrote, which is I think some kind of post-mortem meeting inside the UR team, where we write, we say this to each other, which is, the professional equivalent of saying like, I was the only smart person here, which is the worst kind of like behavior you can adapt if you try to get a company to change its behavior towards you know, UX. And if I'm a dev, it's slightly worse because you know, we make no money, it makes sense for the company to dissolve the team, right? Meanwhile, because I'm a centralized function, I, I keep my job, I keep my things, I move on to other things. Um, so, what was at play is that I'd forgotten that this one tool that I really like, those type of studies, they are valuable like, by themselves, but if you start to compare them to other options you have, there's an opportunity cost. They're really useful at the beginning. Over time, less so, because you could be doing something else. So don't do what I do, <laughs> what I did, and instead try to cap how much money you spend on those kind of like nice, usual things, and then what if instead you kept 30% of your budget to spend it on weird stuff? For example, we call uh, expectation studies a thing where bring people in the lab, we first expose them to, let's say, a trailer, then they get to play. And at the end of the whole thing, how did the two things compare? And doing that usually will get you good data. You'll get um, surprises or insights on price perception, you were f if you're thinking you were doing this bang, this really good $50 game, and they go like, yeah, it's, it's kind of not trash for a $30 game. Or you can, if you're, let's say, uh, working on a live game, what if you brought people in the lab, 
to check what your community managers intend to release to the world. Maybe th you could check that f before they, they do that. A last thing you can do too, bring, uh, you can bring players in your lab and just tell them to install and play in front of you competitors that they like. And this usually will get you good insights because if you don't do that, you might think that your competitive advantage over another you know, game in your area, uh, this is the way that will kind of like knock them over. But maybe you realize that your uh, players don't care at all about that. This is what we thought when it, came, when it came to graphics and quality of graphics. We thought that this is the way that next time we become market leaders. And it turns out that the, our player base, at least, do not care about this stuff. Those were the, the two things I wanted to talk to you about. That's me. And yeah, be smart. Don't do what I did. Learn from my mistakes. <laughs> I have a bit different approach than Jean-Luc. I'm just uh, be a bit more poetic with my budget. So I am Elise. I'm director of operations at Rovio. Rovio is mostly known for the Angry Birds IP. So we have three studios, two in Finland, one in Stockholm, and about 400 employees at the moment. I am the director of operations, and I'm the lead of the user research team. So that's why I'm here today. So a bit of context to start with. Uh, the user research team in Rovio is, is young. We have been doing the craft, introducing the craft in the company about a bit more than two years ago now. Um, it uh, started with a wish from the leadership to create a user-centric design culture at Rovio, which is a very ambitious goal, which we are involved in. We have two researchers uh, that are working centrally in operations with me and uh, dealing with our three studios, which have all a different genre. We have one puzzle studio, one battle studio, and one RPG studio. They work also with marketing and sometimes help uh, licensing. So it's a simplified view. It's actually much more complex, but I think that vehicles the idea quite well. Okay, so we created the, the team. Um, our team's wish is basically, uh, our ambition is to create, to make user research in Rovio an inherent part of the development process and, and get a bigger team in the end. I visualize some hybrid team with part central, part embedded, but we need to get there and we need a budget. So having a budget is never a fun fact to do, and especially when you're centralized. Um, it's very hard to prove like any direct revenue impact. So we had to figure out how to do there. So we decided to, do, to go with a mini, an MVP approach, so minimum viable product. What we did is that we started to gather with the team and we reviewed all the methodology that we had uh, available to us. What can we do with our headcount? What can we do with the background we have? Then we started investigating tools, uh, partners, uh, price, quality ratio, and uh, we were very talkative with uh, all the head of studios to make sure everything was aligned. So we decided to go with like what was the minimum best scenario financially possible with a bit of extra so that uh, we know that usually you don't get everything you ask for, so you will get a bit less, and it's better to ask a bit more and get it decreased rather than ask too little and then ask for an increase. That doesn't go that way. One thing that helps us a lot when we do the budget is that we have a production process in place. We call it the flight path, because birds. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> The process helps us a lot to understand like how many phases each game will go through and how long about each phase lasts. It also describes what are the outputs expected from the game teams after each gate. Between each phase, the game teams go through a green light gate where they have to go with leadership and prove that their game is going on the right track. So what we did with the team is that we created a toolbox. We determined which methods uh, were the best to be used and which tools for each phase and to answer what were the output expected from the leadership and what were the most uh, usual questions that the team asked from us. So we have been concentrating so far since we started mostly on games before the global launch because that's where we feel we have the biggest impact at the moment. 
And so far, before soft launch phase, um, each game's user research budget was about 2% of their overall budget. We are cheap. Then when we do the budget, we have these great questions, which quite often makes you feel like just putting a magic eight ball and putting a random answer, like how many games are we going to work on next year? Great. Not only how many games, which games are going to be your prio, and also which genre each game is going to be, because, OK, if we know we have four puzzle games coming, we are quite fine. We know the genre. We have an audience. We have already existing research. But if a studio comes and tells us, OK, I have this great idea. We are going to make an MMORPG. Like, OK, so we need to start from zero. We need to really understand the genre, look at existing research on the genre, on the audience, look at the player motivations, competitors, players. And even we need to figure if our partners can support us in those research. Can they do? Uh, remote testing, online multiplayer, do they have such a user base at their disposal? So we, we need to start and we need to take that uh, into account from the start. There is no magic formula to really determine this, unfortunately. Uh, what we do is that we look at historical data. From the past, I've been in the company more than six years, so I have a bit of uh, knowledge of how things were in the past, but we try to look at on average per year, how many games go through, how many prototypes per studio, how many of them are killed, how many games are going to be put in passive mode. That means that they won't get any development and they are very low prior for us, so we don't need to really concentrate on those. And because I work with the roadmap directly and with the process, I can tell the team a bit more insights on what we need to concentrate on. Um, basically, per year, we get two to three prototypes to work on per studio, plus the live games. I love the pigs. One thing that helps us a lot as well, because we are such a young team, such a young craft within the company, it's not completely part of the culture yet, and we constantly need to bring the value to justify our existence and our budget, is to be transparent. We realized not so long ago that as much as we were working with the game team per se, leadership was not so much aware of what we were doing and that started to be problematic. We need to be aligned. We need to make sure that our priorities, the game priorities, and the leadership priorities are the same and that there is no issues that we don't know of. So we started developing a process. I love processes. That's why I work in operations. We have monthly meetings which each head of studio and leadership where as a team we come, we say what we are working on, why we are doing that, how much it costs, how much it takes, to make sure that we are all aligned and to make sure that they are also aware of the cost because even if it's our budget, it's going to their PL, to their profit and loss. So if we come and say we did a great, great research, it's only 100K for you, they are not going to be happy and they are not going to support user research within the company, which is very counterproductive for us. One other thing we do is that we send now a monthly report to the leadership, the game teams, and management. What we do in there is that we say per month what we have been working on. We link it to a report with an executive report on the front so that they don't have to go through all the report. Uh, we say how long, why, what were the output of the research, how much it costs, just again to make sure that we are really aligned and what we make has a value and that the craft can keep on living in the company. So overall, what works for us is uh, to have this minimal approach to start with. I hope later on we can increase it, but that's what we start with. Process, really helpful. And transparency, again, is extremely helpful. helpful. And that's about it from me. Thank you. Alrighty, folks, I will wrap this up and I will try and leave time for questions at the end. So my name is Michelle. Uh, unlike these two, I'm actually not a manager. I am a senior researcher, but I do uh, handle the budgets and schedules for my individual projects. I'm actually in charge of everything that is not Call of Duty on console. So it's kind of this big grab bag. Uh, previously, I worked on Skylanders and more recently Sekiro, two days we launch. Um, and also things, uh, I'm currently also on the Crash Team Racing Remaster. So I kind of have this weird grab bag of a variety of things, um, and I handle those schedules and budgets. And when I start those out, I start with my pie in the sky, blue sky, rainbow mile high, whatever you want to call it, ideal. Um, and I expect to have this cut down 
and cut down again and negotiate with the teams, be like, hey guys, this is kind of what we're looking at. And keep in mind, this is definitely an iterative process. It's not something like that's a one and done. I will be talking with my teams constantly and redoing the schedules and budgets, I think, almost on a monthly basis, depending on what the project is. Oh, also, as a note, this is kind of going a little more in depth on what Jonathan Dinkoff did in London. So you guys should check out his talk if you haven't. Um, he also has a lovely Excel for you to look at, which might be a little helpful. Uh, so the first thing I do is I actually create my schedule and I ask myself a variety of questions. And the first two categories can kind of overlap with one another. The first is really what is the planned content of the game? And that can be a variety of things. It could be levels and characters. If you're very narrative heavy, like how long is your actual campaign? Uh, do you have a variety of modes? Like if it's Call of Duty, we have SP, MP, co-op. If it's something else, you need to take that into, uh, keep that into mind. Um, and then specifically with your game, this is where like the genre comes into play. What is the focus of your game? So obviously with Call of Duty, note, I don't do these budgets and or schedules, this is an example, but we have those three different modes. Each of those modes has a very specific kind of focus. So what kind of studies have to be done for that focus? For Skylanders, it was pretty cut and dry. It was, we had characters and we had levels. And we literally had that every time the next title came out, and then maybe a few, like whatever was new for that game. So one year it was create your own character. For another year it was introducing vehicles. But that was kind of a small piece of the bigger pie for those. And more recently, Sekiro. This is a big, very combat heavy, very progression focused game. But we also needed to make sure controls were locked down. And then onboarding, which was very new for this particular developer, that was handled. And then lastly, are there any existing schedules or dates that you can work around? This is something that you might already know. Like, do you have six months? Do you have a year? Do you have a year and a half? Can the developer actually provide you with specific dates? The more specific, obviously the better. But if it's just something general, like we're gonna give you two builds a month, you can still work with that. Also keep in mind something like holidays. I usually don't plan anything around like actual Valentine's Day because people won't come in, but wherever you're at, that definitely plays a part. So now that I have the answers to all of those questions, I can answer the next part, next part which is what kind of studies should we be running and when? You likely have something like this in your own studios or companies. Uh, this is something that we actually share with our studios internally to share and be like, hey, here's an example of the kinds of studies we can run and a general idea of when they are useful in the dev cycle. That's not to say it's a hard and fast rule. This is something that you can kind of decide on and what, what is best for the uh, project and when. So you can do usability as early as they have something to test. You can do place testing at major milestones. So now that I have all of those, uh, there's a general rule of thumb that usability, you can do that earlier, progression and difficulty balancing come later, but keep in mind you can flow with that. So this is an example and you don't actually need to read the, this is, oh dear. <laughs> you don't need to read the specifics on here, but this is an example of a final Skylander schedule um, from a couple of years ago. So you can just really need to pay attention to the colors. So you see a lot of blue and a lot of pink, and then at the end you see a lot of green. So these were character and level studies. Those are blue and pink. And then towards the end, we did a lot of full playthrough or progression studies. So level studies were all usability focused because that's, we had to sit with the kids. They had to play through everything. Characters were a little more um, opinion focused. Like, what do you think of this character? What do you expect them to do? Do they live up to those expectations? And then at the end, okay, we need to actually play through the whole game and get a feel for the entire experience. So this was pretty cut and dry. This was something that we could kind of modify every year and we kind of had an idea of this is what our schedule will look like. We'll have kind of a budget around it. By contrast, this is a, another project. Uh, this was the very first ideal schedule I put together for it. At the top we have some benchmarks and then you see colored uh, pink and blue in there as well. This was based on we know the game has this many bosses and this many levels. And we didn't know how that worked, so we said, okay, we will do discrete specific studies for these features. 
moving on, they're like, hey, actually, we have some title updates. So we didn't know when that was, but we threw it on there. And then we discovered we don't actually need to do individual boss studies because of the style of game. This was more a semi-open world. You can't like just fight a boss by itself. You have to go through the whole level and then run into it. So we said, OK, we will turn it into early, mid, and late game studies. And then these last two, uh, this is just later into testing. You can see overall the number of uh, studies have definitely shrank, which kind of goes to my first point of expect things to be cut back and cut back again. One thing to mention here is that the number of studies overall shrank, but the individual studies themselves actually became a lot uh, more involved. But ultimately, we had to cut down. OK, I have to quick up because we're about to run out of time. Uh, so creating a budget, now that you actually know kind of a general schedule, you can kind of take all this information and just plug it in. And if you have Jonathan Dinkoff's Excel, that will help with that. But um, going off of, do you actually know how big your project is? Does the team already have a set budget? If you know you only have six months, you know you can only do five, six, whatever studies in there. If they're pretty flexible, you can kind of scale up, you can scale back. Some, uh, some projects are very specific and very set. And I will be like, OK, I will not go a penny over. Logistically, figuring out what kind of studies you have, you need to figure out your day cost. How many staff members are going to be on a study? If you're doing the usability, is it just you by yourself? Then you can do that. But that means you'll be spending more of your time. But if you bring in more staff members, you can have less sessions, but you increase the staff cost. So various things like that you need to keep in mind, along with internal versus external recruitment. External is usually more expensive, but they can get you those specific profiles that you need or the very, very large studies. And then lastly, if you have to test, but there are security concerns or money concerns, uh, I like to test with internal people, especially really early on around any sort of security concern. You don't have to really worry about the NDA breach. Similarly, testing with friends or family, they are less kind of NDA worries. And then if you actually do have to cut things, I highly recommend focusing on what your game needs most. If you really, really have to get those combat studies in there, make sure you do, and then maybe cut down on the total number of usability studies or onboarding studies or try and combine studies together. And overall takeaways, this is an iterative process. Prepare to cut back. Focus on what the game needs most and expect hiccups. So for my team specifically, we play lab roulette because lab space is at a premium. And usually I come out as a loser <laughs> because I don't work on Call of Duty. Um, so <laughs> it's OK. So um, most of my studies, I can't have them on the same day of the week. I'll be like, OK, instead of testing on Tuesday, I'll test on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Or I'll shift it down a half hour and kind of just keep that in mind. Another example is a project, I can't say. Uh, <laughs> we were about eight months into testing. I had gone through multiple schedules and budgets that were approved by everybody. And about eight months in, I learned that our entire remaining budget was reallocated to a different feature for the game. So every subsequent study, I literally had to get approved by every single stakeholder. And this, this happened for like the last two to four months. And we got it done, which is great, and shows that they actually were very invested in what we did. But it still threw a big wrench in there. Cool. OK. I think we have a few minutes. All right. We can take some questions here. If you two want to stand in front of the Are we okay. TV with <laughs> Michelle. Uh, do we have any hands? Oh, no. Oh, boy. Oh, dear. OK. No, no, it's up. Hey. Hey, thanks. Thanks for the great talks. Uh, I'm interested in how you communicate these budgets forward through the team. Once you've constructed something really cool that you're happy with, how do you distribute that information? Is it in one form, many forms? Like, how have you done that in the past? <laughs> well, for us, like, we try to have so one budget, which first needs to get approved by my boss, then the head of games, then the head of finance, ultimately the board. And 
So we have an overall amount that we plan per studio and all, and then we have to explain to each studio why they have certain amount of... We go studio by studio and we explain quite differently, depending on who the studio is. We have a sort of similar process where all of our studios actually have their own specific budget for a project, but I thankfully don't have to go that high. Uh, so I will usually get the request from the producer or the designer or somebody working directly on those teams. Sometimes it's per mode. Um, but I will get that whole budget, and I will put together the Excel, and I will just send it to them directly. So I work more directly with the producers and the um, studio heads on that regard. Hi, thanks for uh, really interesting talks all. I'm just curious, uh, within the studio itself, do you, or, do you have assistance from other departments like finance, for example, and maybe the first time that you create like these initial playtesting budget or I guess directives to work with? Or is it really, um, you mentioned uh, starting the, kind of the blue sky or depending on genre, I'm just, uh, I'm curious if you could do a little more detail about that pro part of the process. No, we didn't really get any help <clears throat> like uh, from finance, we know about like what kind of overall budget we are going to get uh, as operations and how much each studio gets. So we can try to work with that, but we didn't really get any guidance. It's just like I've been working with other central products, so I know about how much we can spend on those. But like I said, we, we are creating the craft, so we are still in the period that we need to create the value and estimate on that. And we really made our own homework looking at what are the different tools, prices, partners, and what methodology to concentrate on. So that's basically the approach we took. Well, just to provide some context to the question, I guess I'm wondering if, uh, if like, you charge the clients, in this case, your, for the work, and are you expected to be pro internally profitable in some way? We don't have any P&L. Okay, for, for the lab itself? Research, we don't have a lab, but yeah, for the research team. We don't have any PLL. We are just a cost, basically. <coughs> Yeah, and um, for us, it, it's really hazy. We, at Paradox, we kind of happened. It was not a top-down decision, just like a bunch of QA folks decided that the company needed user research. So they kind of let that happen. The team decided like, okay, for this type of activity, this is the man months cost, you know, simple stuff. And then finance was like, okay, well then in, you know, Swedish cr Kronos, that's what it means. And um, they then gave us kind of, they tried to make us work, right? Because this support optional thing. And they just said like, hey, if, 70% of your time is paid by the games, you're good. <laughs> if it's 69%, uh, usually we need to talk. What, what's going on? Are you guys useless? Uh, it, it's blunt. It, it's not something I would recommend. But I was kind of like their way of just adapting to this weird alien thing that has been, had been thrown their way. Do you guys have any post-mortem processes for your budgets? Any retrospective that you do at the end of the thing to see? Well, we talk with the team, like, did we work completely under or over budget to determine how much we can ask the year after, but not a very processed postmortem per se, just more of an overall discussion with the team, like, how did we do and how we're going to go for next year. I would say <laughs> we're in a similar uh, boat where we don't have exact postmortems. Uh, part of it at Activision is I work with studios for a single project that's pretty siloed, and then I might not see that studio again for a year or two, so it kind of depends. Um, for something pretty templated like Skylanders, yeah, it was actually pretty easy to swap between one studio and then the next, and we could be like, hey guys, this is what we did last time. It was pretty similar. Um, but for individual one-off projects, it's not really something that we have a process for yet. Hi there. I'm curious kind of how you think about budgeting when you're looking at mobile games versus console games and if that's substantially different. Well, I work only with mobile, so I wouldn't know about the rest. <laughs> um, I work a little bit in both. Mobile is still very new for, for um, Activision, so please keep that in mind. It is something we're kind of like exploring and getting into. Um, so we are actually trying to find the best way to test mobile. Uh, and one of the things that's a huge difference is that Mobile needs a long, a longer tail. We need a lot more um, like diary studies or progression studies, which you can't really do bringing people into the lab repeatedly. Um, so we do a lot more of the usability studies like on site, which are generally on the cheaper end. But if we want something larger um, or longer, then we actually add active and have to look at other services for that kind of thing, which is a <coughs> lot more expensive. 
We've got time for one more question. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Um, this will be specifically for Jean-Luc. You say, like, it, this alien thing that came into the company, and I'm, I have a very similar experience currently, and especially with like these core strategy games that are really hardcore, and yep, you do. Uh, <laughs> the, the product managers and designers, they think they really know their audience. Have you had any issues with exposing them to the knowledge? Sometimes maybe they don't actually know that audience, and how did you combat that and maybe convince them of, look, right. yeah. Right, um, so, yeah. Really good question. The answer is like it three years. It takes three years because you're trying to to get behavioral change of the most senior folks that gets challenged the less, right? And so they know, right? Like it, it's somebody earlier said, like I joined I joined the company and every game was really successful. And then I show up. What do I do? How do I prove anything? So it, it took a long while. Like there was a almost like a two years thing where it was like socially, like get, let them to, to like you know, smell them, get used to us. So a lot of it happened outside the office. Uh, a lot of it was, for example, like the thing that helped a lot was to force myself to never have lunch with my team. Because then that forces me to have lunch with other folks. And then two years of me bouncing around, you know, the cafeteria from table to table, um, organizational knowledge of what we do goes up by like 5% or something. And we just won by like a, a thousand cuts. If all of your QAs, half of your game designers, all of your engineers, think that you should play test more <laughs> for like six months to a year the game director will go like nah now nah, i'm good and then one of them will show weakness and will join us <laughs> and but that happened and eight months after that we're looking at you know everybody but two game directors okay. they still haven't changed their mind but i feel like i'm winning <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much elise jean-luc and michelle thank you